All right, so hi everyone and welcome to the, the webinar that is Cold Shower Curious. I've been really excited to, to lead this talk. Cold exposure is something that I've uh, had experience with for probably oh, go, going close to two years now. And uh, through really working with Kate Stillman first, one of the challenges that she ran just involved like a cold shower every morning. And I like stepped up to the plate and I was like, all right, I'm going to do this and see what happens. And from there, my, my journey with cold has really grown. Um, and I, there's some physiological and mental benefits to cold exposure that are definitely, I think, very accessible that I want us to talk about tonight. But I think that there's also been almost an element to my spiritual journey that actually feels that the cold has brought me closer to, I mean, some of the best ways that I can describe it are just like the yin side of, uh, of my experience. If you're kind of looking at the, the world through this framework of yin yang and balancing fundamental dual energies that kind of govern, govern all things. So my, my goals for tonight are to really hit on how we can benefit from cold on a physiological level on a psychological level, and then also on a spiritual level. I'd also love to hear a little bit about like what people here bring to the conversation in terms of like your experience with cold. And if there's any questions that like people have, I'll be happy to do my best to answer them or at least point you towards the resources that I've been using to glean a little bit more wisdom and insight around cold exposure. <clears throat> so before we do this, I want to um, just introduce myself a little bit so everybody has an idea of, of who I am. I feel like I know you all like to varying degrees, um, but doing these, these talks has been a lot of fun in terms of like introducing myself to people based on my own personal and lived experiences. So the last one I did was actually a talk on the negativity bias. I think Rebecca was there. Um, and that was a lot of fun because it's almost just like a marker in my life to sort of see like, oh, what do I have experience with now? What do I kind of have knowledge around or curiosity around that I can start to hold space and engage in conversation with other people? Because that's been one of the best ways that I've found to grow or develop my insight is through connecting with, with other people. So since we're going to talk about cold, I thought I'd include a picture of myself on a beach. Um, <laughs> so basically, I'm, I'm Patrick. I'm a certified yoga health coach. I've got 500 hours yoga teacher certification training. I'm also an actor, singer, dancer. So I think that brings like a unique element to the mix that I was, you know, pursuing the, the Broadway path all the way up until the pandemic happened and my, my life took a big pivot to some of the things that I'm doing now uh, in terms of like thought leadership, for example, and even just like exploring what that would look like to be a thought leader. Not in the sense that, you know, I'm telling people what to think, but rather providing them with structures that are going to help them think in a way that creates the opportunities that are going to give them the results that they're looking to happen in their life with, with more expediency, basically. Um, anytime we want to make something happen for ourselves, which I think is a really beautiful thing about being human, right? That we actually can kind of manifest our own our own realities if we learn how to play the game well. And it's a, I'm big into trying to help people do that. I have an online community that's called Journey to the Peak where we have a monthly yoga membership. We've got Jane Hobbs repping from Journey to the Peak today. <laughs> and I, I run that community with Jane's daughter actually, Shauna Emmerich, who's an incredible New York City yoga teacher. And we've just kind of built this thing from, from the ground up as a response to like our studio closing uh, as a result of COVID, us going online and seeing how we could continue to offer yoga to people, but also with that element and aspect of, of community, which is another cool opportunity for these talks that we do tonight. Journey to You is the year long coaching program that I do. I am starting another round of Journey to You, um, June 28th. So if, if over the course of this talk, that feels like it might be of any interest to you, let's definitely have a conversation because again, in terms of what I feel, how I feel I can be of service right now in terms of getting people to the results that they're seeking in their life, 
that's sort of where I've been putting a lot of effort and investment in, in trying to help people in that way. And, and you'll see that tonight cold therapy is kind of one of those things. The last thing I'll mention here is the mindfulness sitting group that happens most Thursday nights. I'm taking like a couple of weeks off though because I'm about to go traveling. So since I had this picture, I figured I'd also want to show you um, kind of like how my love affair with the cold <laughs> deepened. <laughs> So I mentioned to you all that like I did this challenge with Kate, right? And it was, um, the challenge was intermittent fasting. It was cold showers in the morning. It was Wim Hof breathing, which is about, you know, 30 to 40 minutes, depending on how many rounds you do, of taking deep breaths <sighs> repetitively. And then after you do about 30 of those breaths, you hold at the bottom of your exhale and you, you do a breath retention for as long as you can hold it. And so since I was doing this every single day with the challenge, timing my cold showers, trying to get around three minutes of those in, um, I was able to get up to like a five minute breath hold. And this is where it almost got a little bit spiritual. And I got the inclination that's like, I got to go out into the cold. And I was also hearing, like, if you're in any of Kate's forums, you know, there's a lot of forum engagement. And I was seeing other people posting that, like, they were going outside without their shoes on in the snow. You know, and my first thought is like, well, there's no way that'll be me. <laughs> and then next thing you know, I just remember I was taking a yoga class one day. I saw it was snowing outside and I thought I have to go out there and like get in the snow. And it was, um, it was intense. It was definitely intense, but in a really kind of deep, deep way. And that I think imprinted something on me that just sort of said like, I need to regularly make this a part of my life. Like I need to make cold kind of a regular part of my life. And I would say that that's largely an intuition based thing. So I, I feel like I could go far. So as far as to stake a claim that like the cold has connected me more deeply with my, my intuition. But it's cool, and I, I want to talk about this as we get into some of these protocols for how you actually start to introduce cold into your life if you are, you know, for example, cold shower curious. But like it was an intuitive process for me in that like I let it lead from one thing to the next. You know, I didn't like jump right into the cold, a three minute cold shower. That's kind of my standard right now is I'll start my day with a three minute cold shower. And every day I feel resistance to that cold shower. And we'll talk about that because there's actually a big part of the, the psychological and then the therefore physiological benefit that happens when you engage in something or engage with something that you have resistance for and how we can marketedly or measuredly uh, track our resilience to know just like almost a metric for resilience, the way that we engage with that. So we're going to talk about that. I'm going to draw a couple things out for you guys. Um, I'm going to try to answer some questions around like, what's a good way to start if you're, if you're looking to get a, a start on your cold shower exposure or your cold exposure. I'm going to cite some of the science as best as possible. I'm mainly using this dude, Andrew Huberman. A lot of you guys know him. He's at Huberman Lab from um, Stanford. I would recommend like following him on Instagram and Twitter and YouTube. And you just like, that's, that's a great way to like, just get those little nuggets in your mind. Um, so yeah, and then if we have time, I thought we could even talk a little bit, who's coming from like a yoga background here tonight? Nicole, Jane. Oh, okay, cool, cool. Karen. Yeah, like the kleshas. I think the kleshas actually play a really interesting role in this conversation, specifically the kleshas, which are the distortions of the mind from a yogic point of view. And they, they really are the things that cause misperception. And um, two of the kleshas are attachment and aversion. And I think cold exposure really plays into this notion of like, do the hard thing now go into the thing where there is a aversion. Jordan Peterson actually has this great quote that's like, true spiritual practice is being able to maintain a parasympathetic nervous system response while moving through adversity, to move through adversity while maintaining a parasympathetic nervous system response. And that lately has been my practice kind of in the shower. It's like, I can go in and there are actually benefits if I'm like, Whoa! 
well, all right, here we go, you know? And there's like music <laughs> playing and I'm just moving. There are actually benefits. Huberman talks about that, that that triggers the body into a certain state that releases chemicals to target specific fat cells. But in terms of increasing resiliency, clarity and calmness, there's something to really be said about like trying to ground deep in a, in a rhythm of breath while the cold water is pouring down on you. If you want, I'm just gonna sort of say things that are coming to my mind because I've been immersing myself in all this like cold, cold exposure literature. And I didn't, I didn't do slides tonight, but I can, I can write some things out. But a lot of the things that I was learning, it was like, oh, I did that. I did that without even knowing about it. And here's another example. If you want to increase cognitive function, you can do <laughs> something that's sort of like cognitively um, stimulating or even challenging while you're in the cold. So you try to get your cognition to work while you're in this high stress situation. And the thing that I started doing was, um, I was learning Spanish and I was like, I'm going to count to Spanish in a hundred. Cause when you're learning another language, when it comes to numbers, it's almost like, oh, fuck it. <laughs> it's so, it's so tedious, you know, <laughs> in my Spanish classes, that was always the case. I'd be like doing fine. And then a number would come up, you know, so the, the year or something. And it's like, oh, I never practiced numbers. So I sat in the cold shower and I would try and I would pronounce it too. And that was, um, that was a very interesting exercise to engage with because it being linguistic, it's also a little bit physiological. Okay, so I've kind of mapped out some goals for the night, but before I go any further, I would love to open up the floor and just hear, you know, either by way of introduction, if you would like to say hello, introduce yourself, say where you're from, but also any little tidbit that you would want to share about your experience with cold and or what brought you here. I think we're a small enough group that we can, we can kind of do that. So feel free to unmute yourself. No pressure to share if you don't want to only if you uh, feel encouraged. Yeah, hi, Patrick, I, I can start off with sharing maybe. So I'm, I'm German and um, I live in New Zealand and I live in Auckland where the climate is quite steady throughout the year, which is beautiful, but I miss the cold. So we don't get any snow here and I'm used to having snow. So I really, really miss the snow. And um yeah, I love the idea as a yoga teacher to like being at ease when you feel discomfort in your body. So I like the idea to yeah, maintain a parasympathetic um, response while you go through adversity. So I really am intrigued by this idea. And my experience with cold showers is that um, I try to do them. <laughs> I start off with a warm shower. I continue the warm shower because I dread turning it, turning the tap to like the cold shower. So my warm shower is continuing, continuing, continuing until I'm brave enough to turn it to cold. Eventually I turn it to cold and there's no ease in my body. There is no parasympathetic response. So I'm completely freaking out. So I'm at the very, very, very beginning at maybe, yeah, embracing a cold shower. Yeah. That's great. We can talk about that. Thanks, Nicole. Well, um, I'm Jane Hobbs and I'm in Middletown, Ohio in the USA. Um, actually, long, long time ago, a lady I used to work with would tell about how she would take her shower. At the end of her shower, she'd turn the water on cold. And she said she's, she was, um, that was how she stayed healthy. She never got colds because she mm -hmm. said she took a cold shower at the end. But um, I don't do that all the time, but I'm like um, the other lady that just spoke. Um, I like to take a warm shower because in the morning that seems to make my body not ache so much <laughs> and then I'll turn on the cold shower and it's um it's more like when you're doing yin yoga I just kind of relax into it and kind of 
breathe through it for, I don't do three minutes, but maybe a couple of minutes. And then one other thing, <clears throat> well, I worked in the medical profession and I also, I noticed that there are some patients that wanted to be cold when they were in the hospital in bed, <clears throat> excuse me, they wanted to be cold. Where, where I, if I'm not feeling good, I want to be warm. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm wanting to find out what you say about that. <laughs> so that, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that sounds good. I've noted it down. So I am Nicole also <laughs> from, uh, from Canada, other side of the world. Um, so I'm in, in Nova Scotia. Um, my relationship with the cold has been per pretty precarious my entire life. I'm allergic to the cold. Mm. So hives, swelling, you name it. I didn't know the name of it until probably 10 years ago. And I'm in my early fifties. So for 50 years, I get that. And so I've been hearing this. So I've always, and I'm talking snow in my boots, a welt that thick around my ankles when <laughs> snow in my boots outside walking in the cold hives all here my nose swells it's it's pretty interesting I don't wear rings because my hands swell and I have to cut them off so <laughs> um well I'm curious obviously I'm here I want to hear about it I keep wondering so I've I've I have other reactions that involve swelling to like mosquito bites and things like that. And since I've been doing intermittent fasting, the inflammation has come down and my reactions have reduced. And I haven't been brave enough to find out if my reaction to the cold is reduced. Mm -hmm. And so ocean here, 17 degrees Celsius, that is, if the, the air temperature is different enough, I'll get hives. So that's yeah. even a, wow. it, like not even cold, snow cold, right? So yeah. um, I have, I have moved from hot showers to warm showers and then bringing it down to tepid. Uh, mm. I feel better with that. And it's also like less drying on your hair and your skin and all of that. And as I get older, that dries even more. But this year I'm like, is the pool ready? I want to go jump in the pool. I want to see if the hives are going to come. So I'm curious to see what this might bring. I'm not committed to jumping in all the time, but yeah. I'll see what, what happens. That's where I'm sitting. Yeah, but so much of what I hear in there too is like really being the, you know, the one who's running the experiment and like collecting the data to see what creates what. And I think that that's really the way you have to go with, especially if you're going into something like um, kind of extreme, like there is something a little bit extreme about some of these protocols and the, the self-awareness piece, I think is really critical in terms of just like keeping that presence for like why, why you're doing this and, and what, it's, what it's doing for you. Like, I really believe that it should be fairly a direct connection that you make that like, oh yeah, I do this, high, this sort of fairly intense thing for the following reasons, not just because you're like a masochist, you know? <laughs> and, and so I hear that in that too. It's like, oh, cold gives me hives. What's that about? Like, then the inquiry is opened and now you'll, you'll continue to like, you know, use the light of your consciousness because you're, you're on a healing journey and you're in a community where you're supported in that, which is really cool. Um, so yeah, okay, thanks for bringing that in. Who wants to go next? I will. Um, okay. Karen, uh, I'm in Chatham, New York. Um, and yeah, I guess, um, so I don't necessarily have a bad relation, not bad, I have an okay relationship with the cold. I consider myself kind of hot blooded and like, I have always been a winter hiker. Like my jacket is off five minutes after I'm hiking because I'm, um, and, um, but the thing is like with the cold shower, I mean, if it's a warm day, I will enthusiastically take a cold shower. I just, I think I'm, um, 
working on making habits, like daily habits, like not just out of this, but about, out of other things. And um, I, I'm curious about like what the benefits are of doing it on a regular basis, kind of long-term maybe, um, cause I'll do it here and there, but it's just not anything I've consciously thought about making into a habit, I guess. And so maybe I'd be encouraged if I had some, had some reasons in mind. Um, and then the other thing is just, uh, this has gotten a lot better for me over the last couple of years through breath work stuff. But, um, I had a real issue with anxiety and panic attacks. Like I, I was diagnosed panic disorder, um, for close to 15 years. Um, and the breath work has helped incredibly with that, but I just think anything that like can help keep my nervous system regulated would be a benefit, so. Totally, totally. Okay, awesome. We can totally talk about that. Oh, um, I may have to put my uh, picture up at the end. I'll still be listening, but I okay. have to walk somewhere. <laughs> okay, yeah, no problem. no problem. I'm glad you're here. So um, my name is Rebecca. This is my husband, Mark, and we live Mark. in central Pennsylvania. Yeah, central Pennsylvania, Seals Grove specifically. And um, I did um, I did one of these challenges um, with Patrick, I believe, uh, December into January um, was when I did my challenge. Um, and the whole cold shower thing does not really appeal to me, but I'm really, really curious about the benefits of it. And, um, and so I've worked with it a little bit, mostly, mostly moving from the warm shower into finishing with a cold, colder one, not like cold, cold yet, but, um, but I'm, I'm just really curious. And so I'm trying to make, make strides towards that and doing a little cooler showers than I used to even starting out. Um, and then Monday, uh, Mark and I went to this local swimming hole kind of place that's, that's fed by, um, fed by springs and creeks and stuff like that. So the water is icy cold all the time. And, um, yeah, so Mark timed me, it was like, one to two minutes that I stayed in and I just plunged right in because I knew I wouldn't do it otherwise. And um, I was definitely, there were children, plenty of kids playing in the water, no adults, or if there were adults, they were like up to their knees and that was it because um, yeah, it's just too icy. But uh, yeah, so I thought, eh, what the heck? And I survived and it wasn't that, that terrible. I was you know, I was pretty pleased. So, um, yeah, so I'm just really curious about all the benefits and where it could possibly improve, improve things. And so I, I drug hubby along for the ride tonight. Nice. Nice. So, yeah. okay. All right, cool. Well, this gives us, I think, plenty to talk about. So thank you all so much for kind of like putting your, putting your word in there. And um, I'm trying to think of where to where to start here, because so much of what was mentioned uh, is aligned with some of the things that I, I do want to talk about tonight. Um, let's start with circadian rhythms, because this is something that a lot of you already have a fair amount of knowledge around based on your exposure to like some of Kate Stillman's work and Body Thrive. And it, these are habits that similarly that I coach in Journey to You, and they're all basically, and you were mentioning habits a little bit, Karen, because I think it's, it's a smart thing to want to focus on, because at the end of the day, our habits are who we are. <laughs> you know, the things that we do repeatedly actually end up manifesting as our identity, and as an extension of our identity, you know, our our ripple effect out into the world. And I mean, there's kind of, of course there's different kinds of habits that you can have, 
one of the things that I've been interested in lately is like having habits that tie me more closely back to my identity as nature. And so as I, as I most naturally am in my natural state, because there's a lot of things today in culture that aren't reflected of, um, what would I say, like nature in its integrity, right? And that actually kind of get us out. And one of the things about being in integrity is that you, act, you get into deep rhythm with nature. I had mentioned earlier this concept of the yin and the yang being the two governing forces that everything pulses back and forth between. And this is very much reflected in nature, whether you wanna look at it as the night and the day, or the summer and the winter, or the hot and the cold. But basically, these circadian rhythms have been identified all the way down to our identity as cellular creatures, right? And so the cells have a rhythm, and tied into the rhythm of our circadian rhythms is actually our, our core body temperature. And so your core body temperature fluctuates based on the time of day. And what they've identified as the circadian rhythm of core body temperature is that about two hours before you wake up in the morning. So it looks like this person might wake up around, I don't know, eight o'clock or so, maybe seven o'clock. Two hours before you awake, your body is at its lowest temperature of the day. And then it looks like, you know, sometime a little more than 12 hours after that, your body gets to its highest temperature of the day and then it descends. But there's a pretty clear pattern here that we can see that the temperature of the body drops during sleep. And that's actually one of the, it becomes like a prerequisite for sleep that the body wants to be in a lower temperature to get into like the deep, deep REM sleep. Now, another core thing to understand when you're looking at deliberate cold exposure. And we'll, we'll talk about this whole thing as deliberate cold exposure, because it actually ends up being a big part of getting the benefit is because you're doing the thing out of your own choosing. You know, you're actually choosing to stay in and remain in the high stress situation. And there are shifts that end up happening even cellularly as a result of that. The other thing that we want to factor in, so you've got the core body temperature on one hand, and then on the other hand is this concept that the body will self-regulate using thermogenesis, basically, to maintain the core body temperature for where it's supposed to be according to the circadian rhythms. So this to me is really, I guess if I just put it in one like big benefit of deliberate cold exposure is kind of getting the body more into a, an alert state to be able to regulate itself back to homeostasis after stress, because it, it's, it's learned how to do it. I've been using this mantra lately, a friend of a student of mine said it, like I can because I have. And it's been really useful for me when I've been coming up against challenging things. And I think this is kind of similar. So what happens when we get the body into this like really, so now, as you can imagine, if you're ex exposing yourself to cold deliberately for an extended amount of time, what's that going to do to the core body temperature? You know, it's going to, it's going to drop it, especially if it's full immersion cold. And actually um, this is interesting and this might be a bit of a tangent. So just bear with me if it is. It even depends on like where the cold touches your body for it to affect your core body temperature. And so Huberman details out this experiment where like, you know, imagine if you were really hot, really sweaty, really just fired up. If somebody handed you a wet, cold towel, he asks everybody, oh, you know, where would you put it? You probably think you would want to put it on your, your head, drape it over your body to cool yourself down. This would actually have the opposite effect. And it would be, it's likened to taking, you know, a bag of a Ziploc bag of ice and putting it over your thermostat because your thermostat is going to register that as like, oh, there's, there's cold here. I better heat the body up. So it's, 
it actually ends up having the opposite effect because the person's trying to cool down. So the, the, it's almost like the, the vehicle of deliverance for the cold kind of matters. And the good news is, is that there are certain like areas of our body that can release heat more readily. And I forget exactly what they were called, like glab, globoreal or something kind of weird. They're portals. <laughs> They're like portals for temperature. And it's your palms, it's the soles of your feet, and it's the top half of your head, apparently. So that's my little tangent about these, these portals that help to release heat. If you find yourself ever in an, an overheated situation, this kind of gets back to like something that Nicole was saying, if you're looking at it from an Ayurvedic perspective, it's like if the body is responding to cold by releasing excess heat, like what, what's the story there, <laughs> you know? And that's where it's just fun to get really curious and kind of like uh, investigative. And, and like I mentioned, really running your own experiments. So that was a tangent because when you're fully immersed in cold, you're gonna decrease your body, your core body temperature. Now, when the core body temperature is decreased, and this is an important thing to factor in when people ask about like, well, should I take a cold shower and then do a hot shower? It feels really good. It's kind of like, sure, do, it, do whatever you want. You're still gonna be better off probably for having gone through and had the cold exposure. But what they're saying is that there's actually extra benefits if you let the body warm itself up naturally because your body is gonna start to go into source energy from places where maybe it hasn't sourced energy from. And this is, I'll just keep kind of trying to sprinkle things in as they, as they come to me, but this is where cold exposure can actually be used for, I won't even say fat loss, I'll say like fat conversion. Because what happens is that when the fat here is white fat, it's more in energy storage mode, it doesn't have the same thermogenetic, if that's a word, capabilities as brown and beige fat. So you're, sort of, you're sort of uh, categorizing it into these two different types. You've got brown and beige. And, you know, Kate Stillman is like super into all of this stuff. If you've been following any of her stuff with um, what she's working on with wild habits. But when you've got the white adipose tissue, it, the fat energy is actually locked inside the cell it can't get out. Cold is one of the things that helps unlock the store, the energy store in the cell to then be used as thermogenesis, be used to actually start to warm the body up, bring the body back to its core temperature. If I were to attempt to address some of the questions like, like Jane's question about like, what do you make of the people who are always they always run cold and they're trying to warm up or that, you know, I would stipulate that there is something around their core body temperature. There's something out of, out of rhythm, but then we also just all kind of run at our own unique, unique way. You know, if it's creating an imbalance, then it could be addressed. And I really see like something like cold exposure, almost being like a, um, Hey, let's hit reset here a little bit, <laughs> you know? Let's like let the system, let's kind of like shock the system and then let the system recalibrate and, and get a, a clean slate. It certainly does feel like it has a, um, a waking up, sort of a potent waking up and alerting energy and how you would think about that from a, a physiological point of view is that you're going to experience a surge of adrenaline paired with noradrenaline and that's also called epinephrine or norepinephrine. And these are these like stress chemicals that kind of like flood the body with in agitation in a way. And they, they work in pairs. And I, I guess norepinephrine or noradrenaline are oftentimes released with dopamine as well. Dopamine is the motivation chemical oftentimes confused as the chemical of pleasure, like dopamine gives us pleasure. It really, dopamine actually just motivates us to want more of the thing that's producing the dopamine. So it's like, sure, if it's sugar, it's probably, there's, there's some pleasure going on, but it's really just more so motivating you to want more. 
I always tell this anecdote about dopamine with food because I think it's kind of interesting. It, it kind of has nothing to do with cold, but I'm pretty sure I also got it from this guy Huberman is that our body will also regulate the amount of dopamine that's produced based on the diet that you're eating. But it does this based on you selecting a diet of variety. So if you're eating broccoli, you know, Monday, dopamine. If you're eating broccoli again, Tuesday, less dopamine. <laughs> again, Wednesday, less dopamine. And so to encourage for diversity, the body will actually release dopamine when the, the diet is diverse. This doesn't apply to sugar. That's like the kicker with dopamine and sugar is that you could be eating sugar any day of the week, the body's just producing dopamine. So dopamine is a chemical that we can leverage. It's definitely something that can help us be in a state of motivation and you will probably experience it as a result of cold exposure. But really the larger surge of energy that's coming is this adrenaline nor adrenaline that's helping to induce a state of agitation. It's helping to induce a state of even focus, um, possibly evolving into like desire and, and mood. So really like uh, people oftentimes, if you're looking for some sort of improvement in mood or improvement in your level of attention, cold exposure could be a tool or a protocol for you because basically your mental, you know, your mental state is shifted when you step into the cold. Um, one of the very common questions, I guess, that he gets a lot is like, how cold does it need to be? And the best advice that he was giving on that was saying, basically, so uncomfortable that it makes you want to get out, but safe enough to stay in. So it's uncomfortable enough to make you want to get out, but not to the point where you're putting yourself in any sort of physical danger. If you have trouble gauging whether or not you're putting yourself in physical danger, I would just say err on the side of caution, you know, err on the side of like, I don't know. I, I think it should be fairly obvious. <laughs> like, you, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't, it's, it's an interesting thing when you're pushing through a threshold right? Because you always, we have, this happens in yin yoga a lot too. You want the person to be safe. You don't want them to break past their threshold of tolerance, but that is the exact threshold of adversity that we were speaking about earlier that we're trying to maintain the parasympathetic response through. And so my insight tells me that like, it will be fairly obvious if this protocol does not work you know, there will either be some sort of pain or your body is going to like, you know, communicate to you that this is a no-go for you. So that being said, other good ways to start, I oftentimes do say like, go for that splash. Like a lot of you have already alluded to, go for that splash at the end of your shower. And then what it really becomes about is seeing how long you can stay. And we'll talk about this, um, We'll talk about this next, because I think this is fairly interesting. This actually crosses us over now into some of the, um, like the mental benefits of cold exposure. I tried to draw this out yesterday. Let me see if I can find that. No, I'll draw it again. This is all about increasing resiliency. Because basically what's happening is that you're experiencing resistance to a highly stressful situation that you don't want to go through and encounter. We'll put the shower over here. Or maybe it's an ice bath, I don't know, whatever it is for you. I'll stick with the shower theme because it's cold water curious or cold shower curious.
basically what he's trying to lay out in terms of how you can start to measure your resility your resilience improve as a result of engaging in these cold shower protocols is that there's these different walls. He calls them walls. And, and they're walls that are basically like surges of this chemical being released through your body, this stress sort of like, you know, adrenaline, noradrenaline chemical that's being sent through your body basically to tell your body to get away from that situation, to, to mobilize you to do something else. But instead what ends up happening, and this is where it gets both like um, physiological and just like psychological, is that your prefrontal cortex starts to engage in a top-down way of being. So you're now doing mind over matter to override that surge and to move through the wall. And what he's saying is that there's actually a number of these walls that may happen before you even step into the cold. So you can leverage those as, as further opportunities to engage with and improve resiliency. And, and what he actually suggests is that you count the walls, count those moments that, and watch them, count those moments as you move through them, I guess I'll say. Because once you're then in the cold, you're gonna experience more of them. And I was curious about this as I was listening, I'm like, what is it like for me when I'm experiencing a surge, a wall basically of resistance and I'm overriding that from a, a prefrontal cortex idea to stay and to resist the urge to run away. And, um, I realized what it was. It was that I oftentimes in my cold showers, I'll look to my phone to check how much longer I have left. And you know, some minutes, it's a three minute cold shower. Some minutes I look and it's like, it hasn't even been a minute yet. And it already feels like I'm in there for quite a while just cause it's like, it's a fairly intense, intense situation that you're stepping into. So something that I could do, and I actually haven't done this since I listened to the podcast, but um, when I get that prompting to like check the time, see how much time is left, override it, override it. And there's probably some more notes I can read to you guys based on what I took about this because it's, it's very interesting. In terms of resilience, it's the ability to resist escape from the stressor, the cold, by virtue of your willpower, which is your prefrontal cortex, causing top-down control on your reflexes which includes your limbic system, your hypothalamus, which is basically telling you to get out of the cold. And in overriding those things, you're getting better at controlling your behavior when your body is flooded with epinephrine, norepinephrine. So think about that, just like sort of sit with that for a second, to be able to be better at controlling your behavior when your body is flooded with epinephrine, norepinephrine. Because these stressors, they end up happening in forms that are not just cold showers, <laughs> as I'm sure all of us are familiar with, right? Sometimes it's like a text message comes in and it's like, you know, total surge, epinephrine, norepinephrine, right? Has that ever happened to anybody? You get a phone call, you run into somebody in the supermarket, whatever it is, somebody says something and the whole body sends you into a stress response. Karen was talking about this a little bit earlier. You know, some, sometimes we have these anxiety attacks and there's something physiological about them, right? And we lose control of our behavior. And so this is sort of where cold shower deliberate cold exposure shows up as a means of trying to, I mean, I hate to say control behavior because it sounds almost rigid, but like to be able to self-regulate when you need to, because I think that's a valuable tool to have in our, our spiritual toolbox, you know, to be able to self-regulate when I need to. In terms of the walls, he talks about counting the walls. And every time you have a wall, it's that sensation of like, no, I don't want to do that. But you, you, you do it anyways. Um, 
he talks about the interoceptive awareness of the when of when the next wall arrives. That's really interesting. That you're actually starting to cultivate an interoceptive awareness for like when you're going to be resistant again. And yeah, like some days just getting into the cold represents a wall. And he likes to sort of designate the walls before he starts the protocol. So he knows that one of the walls is going to be getting in. One of the walls is going to be staying, you know, maybe checking, not, not checking the time, like I mentioned. Okay, I want to pause and just see if there's any questions, any thoughts from anybody on any of this based on what I've gone into so far. Have we answered some of the questions? Tried, I don't know. <laughs> Are we good to keep plugging away? Yes, for me, okay. All right, cool. Is this interesting? Is this um, in the realm of, okay. Is the, is the curiosity being somewhat satiated? Okay, good. Um, Cause yeah, we totally, I do wanna go into the Kleshas. Let me just scroll through this. He talks about your mental state. I can share this again too. My, my writing is super messy, but... Um, <clears throat> You're trying to calm yourself. You're trying to lean into the challenge and, and really grind it out. And so that could be a good goal for anybody who's looking to start. Like maybe you say like, I'm gonna do 30 seconds. And I, I definitely would advise small and measurable steps as you're trying to do new habits. James Clear talks about that any new habit you're starting should be less than two minutes. And when you're applying that to a cold shower you might wanna make it like less than 30 seconds. And, and part of the point there is that you actually can really celebrate the win of having done the hard thing. So now we're into mindset as well, that we can actually start to evolve mindset, which is totally gonna to show up for you in the rest of your day. Yeah, he talks a little, he, talk, he uses this gravel road analogy and there's something about that in terms of like getting through deliberate cold exposure. It's like you're on a gravel road. You kind of just have to ride it out and, and calm yourself. Um, everyone experiences shortness of breath when you first step in. I will say that I remember when I first got in, I had that experience that like my breath was stolen from me, <laughs> right? If anybody's ever done a polar bear plunge or anything, you may have had a similar experience. We did that growing up. Uh, we did a polar bear plunge. And I remember every year thinking that like, <gasps> it's like, it, it really, it steals your breath from you. That happened to me the first couple of times I stepped into my cold showers once I started going full cold and it no longer happens. So that tells you already a lot about the way that the body can account for what is a highly stressful or sensational experience. Okay. Um, there was something else I was going to say about that. I, I do take hot showers and I will say that when I take hot showers now, it makes them like dessert. I mean, they're just so pleasurable. It's very, it's hard to describe. And I, um, I really, I relish them now in a different way. Yeah. Cognitive experience with cold exposure. I talked about that in terms of, um, the, the counting in Spanish, teaching the prefrontal cortex how to stay engaged during high stress situations. So again, your prefrontal cortex, and you guys remember like actor, singer, dancer, I definitely did not study neurology or anything, but to the best of my understanding, it's, it's a bit of the control center that's gonna help you plan and design. So much of what stops people, and I get this question as a coach all the time, is like, what stops me? Why, why can't I do this? Like, I'm in my own way. And it's kind of, it's true. And it's because, you know, the body has these unreconciled traumas and habit loops that are tied into its relationship with what is a stressful situation and what isn't a stressful situation. So if we can't access the part of our design that can 
plan and design, especially in the face of stress, and life is very stressful right now. Kate talks a lot, a lot about this in terms of VUCA. The world is very VUCA, volatile, uncertain, chaotic and ambiguous. I think that's what that stands for. And so, yeah, there is stress out there. How can you keep your prefrontal cortex engaged? Cold shower, cold exposure, this is a protocol that, um, yeah, I can, because a lot of it's like, it's just about learning the mechanics of how to do it. And then it becomes circumstantial. You know, it, it applies differently to different sets of circumstances, but it's the same tool that you're using. Teach people to engage in cognitive performance while experiencing stress. I must have had to learn how to do some of that as an actor. Anybody else in here have like theater or theater arts training? There must have been a little bit of that, that I was like, okay, how can I keep my cool while being up here in front of a thousand people or, or whatever it was? And I would get nervous. I would, I would always get nervous. I would get nervous walking into the audition room. A lot of times my body would be shaking. You know, I was, and it's, it's another interesting, like look for these places in your life where your prefrontal cortex has a hard time overriding the rest of the response. Does this make sense? Is this, okay. Again, not, I kind of like have no idea what I'm talking about. I think this is you know, like the idea, but basically you understand the principles. You know, you understand that there are these, and yoga gets really into this too, into these compartments of our mind. It's, it's not so much neurology of the brain, but just anatomy of the mind. Because the mind is a, uh, is a metaphysical thing. We've talked about breaking up the thermal regulator layer. Um, we talked about dopamine. Let's see. We talked about white fat cells and beige fat cells and brown fat cell cells. The darkness has to do with apparently like whether there's mitochondria present in the fat cell. And so the, the darkness of like a brown fat cell shows that it contains mitochondria. And so I guess, Broadly speaking, we've talked about like benefits of cold exposure for stress inoculation, ways to remain more alert, aware, and in control during stressful situations. And then the other side of it, if we, we want to look at like physiological benefits, is you could say that it could increase your metabolism. And that has everything to do with the conversion of the beige and brown fat cells from white fat adipose tissue. Because when you're talking metabolic, it's like, where are we sourcing energy from? What's, what's kind of, yeah, where are we sourcing energy from? He goes into this whole thing that I'm sure Kate would love. That's all about like, if you do cold exposure at the peak of your fast, you get even more <laughs> like chemical cocktail benefits. And then he goes one step further that if you time it and have coffee two hours before your cold exposure on the peak of your fast, you're like, you're raking all those, like those good hormones in. And they do end up making like a marked difference apparently. Um, so yeah. All right, I've kind of gone, I've kind of gone an hour. I'd be willing to talk about the clashes if people are interested in that, but I also want to just like, just check in and see like, did we answer specific questions? Does anybody want any sort of coaching on this in terms of like, where should I start? Or what's my next step? Feel free to ask that too. I would love to hear somebody's next step. <laughs> what they think they might try as a result of just being here tonight. And maybe it's just like talking about it or looking up an article. So I would try and maybe stay a little bit longer yeah. and um, probably not long enough to even look at my watch or my phone. Um, I try to identify one of these walls, maybe, maybe okay. try and find the first one. I mean, I know there's already the first one when I turn from warm to cold. So I've mm -hmm. definitely identified that and I, I'm always kind of very 
reluctant moving through this one, but um, I'm aware of it now. So I'm trying to find the next one now. Yeah, I think, and take a moment before you get in an inventory that like, okay, I know there's gonna be a wall when I change the temperature. And I know I'm gonna stay through one more wall when I wanna get out, I'm just gonna stay for like three more breaths. And um, account for the walls before they happen. I'd be curious to hear how that goes for you, Nicole. Okay, yeah, thanks. Cool, cool. Anyone else wanna share anything? I have a kind of thought sitting here um because I've been kind of like um you know the the analogy of putting you put a lobster into boiling water or you put the like you put the frog into a pot of water and yes. then heat it slowly and you, yes. so I feel like I have been taking the frog except I'm cooling the water slowly. I'm barely noticing the difference. Yeah, well, and, and what's so present in that analogy is like the frogs don't know that they're actually dying. Right. Does everybody know this analogy that Rebecca is speaking of? Yeah, it's like, it's, it's basically the analogy of like people with, you know, negative stressor habits that create chronic inflammation. And the, it's a slow, build up over time and you might not notice it, but eventually it create it, it makes the environment that you're in so unsafe that you just, that you die. <laughs> so I also <laughs> want to like, I want to make sure that this is the right metaphor for what you're talking about. Cause a little bit of what I hear you saying is like, I might not be able to afford like going at a slow rate and like, do I just need to, to step in and like step up? <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny um, because, oh, gosh, sometime this winter, I I didn't realize about maybe going in steps. Yeah. And I just went all out cold and it took my breath and all that. And yes. I was just like in shock and um, I, I could not breathe. And so then <laughs> somebody said, you got to breathe, you know, and um I was, I just felt like that was too much at once. Um, so then I have tried this other method. And so I'm asking myself, well, am hey, I elsewhere in order? What's the other method? The other method of reducing the temperature slowly. Oh yeah. Okay. Got it. Got it. So that, um, so then I'm looking, you know, and I'm like, well, gosh, you know, I, I barely even notice the difference by the end of the shower. Like I'm, I'm pretty comfortable, yeah. but um, anyway, I tell you what, one thing you made me think of about checking the time mm -hmm. for how long you've been in there. Yeah. That makes me think of two, two things that I have struggled with, continue to struggle with that are hard for me. And that's doing breath work. Yeah. and sitting in meditation that I'm like oh my god how much time do I have left you know and but the more I can do those um now I can do just about five minutes of breath work and it feels like it's been five minutes and I and I'm not looking at my watch so much anymore but um yeah, I barely even look anymore, but I, I can relate to that because I'm getting a little more comfortable with the uncomfortable, but yeah. Um, yeah. That's a big part of this. And congrats on the five minutes of breath work every day. I mean, that is- that's Well, it's not every day yet, but- <laughs> okay, so, so when you do it, congrats. Cause I mean, that's five minutes of breath work that probably most Americans will never see in their life, you know? And that's just the unfortunate, like, that's just the trend right now. And I'm, I'm big into like wanting to be a part of the trend that reverses that. Cause I think, you know, one of the things that really stood out to me that he talked about in these videos is the concept of minimum, minimum threshold of stimulus that also achieves maximum benefit. 
So like, you don't have to do this like crazy intense thing, but you figure out like, what's the minimum threshold of stimulus to get the maximum benefit out of the thing. And I'm going to put the podcast in the chat just so everybody has a chance to listen to it. It's probably about like a two hour podcast. I, it was very well worth my time. I listened to it twice. Um, if, if you want to hear anything, if anything in here struck you as interesting, you might just check that podcast out because most of everything I said came from there. <laughs> a little bit of my own, my own things too. But I think, you know, there's a lot of different ways to look at how we can incorporate cold exposure into our routines. Like you could be doing something where you're, you're looking like very specifically and carefully for like, what is the benefit that's manifesting as a result of this? Right now, I just sort of treat it as like, um, you know, getting sun salutations in or, mm -hmm. I just like, it's a, it's a regular repetitive thing that I do that I don't think about that much. I've been provided with a lot more to think about with some of these protocols and maybe I'll start to do that, but it's almost rote for me now that I just take a three minute shower, cold shower in the morning. And, and it saves me a lot. Like when I'm traveling, you know, or when I, when I've had kind of a late night, <laughs> or maybe stayed up a little bit later. I had like a little bit more to drink. In terms of like carrying all of that over into the next day for a long time, I find a cold shower really kind of helps to, to wipe the, the slate clean for me. Um, with Rebecca, some of the things you were saying, I'd also encourage you to really like look specifically at how you're measuring your progress and be in a positive growth oriented relationship to, to those achievements. I mean, even just the fact that, you, that any of you are here experimenting with cold. Because one of the cool things I think about like this practice and these protocols is that they're free. You know, unless you're ready to go out there and like buy the cryo tank or the ice bath thing, you know, we can all, we can all you know, go and turn our tap on and get some cold water, right? For the most part. And so it's, uh, I'm always interested in some of these like freer or low cost solutions or situations to very real problems when we're talking about hormonal imbalances, when we're talking about uh, chronically heightened stress levels that are, I mean, both on an individual and a collective level. So uh yeah, I think it's sort of, it sounds a little corny, but like a little cold can go a long way. It, it could actually help to wake some people up to, um, to what's going on here, you know? And, and a, lot of, so a lot of that just has to do with awareness. I, I like to think too, like how would we have been, you know, in water or in relationship with like submerging ourselves in water from an evolutionary perspective for more often than not, to, to come across hot water would have been like a real, yeah. you would have gone to like a bath, you know, a bathhouse to get it for a lot of people. Um, so in terms of like the remembering of who we are, I'll, I'll just like throw this up there, see if there's any other questions and we can kind of wrap this up. You know, yoga, yoga basically is a, a practice that helps us to get reacquainted with the true nature of, of who we really are and to overcome some of the obstacles that prevent one from understanding and having a, an understanding of their true nature, their true self, which is largely, um, love, <laughs> just like a love-based heart-centered thing. And, and one of the things that the yoga sutra is going to detail to talk about what prevents us from understanding our true nature are these things that are called kleshas. And so I'm looking over here in the bottom right-hand corner. And he lays the kleshas out basically right at the top of the second chapter of the Yoga Sutras. And here they are, avidya, asmita, raga, devesha, abhinavesha, klesha. It says here that the five kleshas are what cause the mind to become engrossed in the belief patterns that create mental disequilibrium and physiological distress. The five kleshas are avidya, better like also known as ignorance, 
when the mind fails to see itself in its proper relationship to Atman or you know soul self. Asmita, asmita is our belief that we are separate in our individuality, so it's the ego. These are the two that are interesting for me with cold. Raga is our mind's attachments to those things that we like and are attracted to. Dvesha is our mind's rejection of those things that we dislike and are averse to. Abhinavesha is the fear that comes from believing that the mind's construct of who we are has to survive and that death is the end. So the main two that I wanna focus on are these two, Raga and Dvesha. And I think it's kind of just obvious as to why I wanna talk about them. Devesha or aversion is like, we have an aversion to the things that we dislike or that are unpleasant or unfamiliar. And we tend to have an attachment to the things that we do like or the things that we're attracted to. So I could say that like, I had to kind of work through an attachment I had to having warm showers, you know, before I, honestly, before I ever even was doing cold shower therapy, I remember once I was in a, I was in India and it was like a bucket shower situation. And that was like, oh, okay. Like there's no, there's no, what do you do about that? You know, you just, you deal with it. You, you get, you pass the aversion, but, and this comes back to the idea of deliberate cold exposure, that this is of your choosing, that the hot water tap is right there, but you're still deliberately overriding that and doing the thing that you have the aversion to. And the way that the kleshas work is that they're like twists. So I sort of see that like when they untwist, the perception becomes clearer. And I guess as uh, to kind of wrap this up, if I were to put it in, in a broad statement, one of, the, one of my things with cold exposure, with cold showers is it's, it's brought a level of clarity to my experience that I, uh, I don't even know if I'm fully articulate around it. You know, it's made me do some crazy things like run around outside without my shoes on in the snow. And, um, but it's, uh, it's been a remarkable, it, it's sensorial, you know, and it's, it's really done something for my evolution. I guess I'll just, I'll put it that way. It's a language that I think a lot of you are here are familiar with. <laughs> So any, uh, any final questions here? Anything that anyone wants to just uh, throw in as takeaways even, or questions before we kind of wrap this thing up? Maybe something you learned? I'd be curious to hear. I think uh, when you were talking about um, it helping to improve your resilience, I think um, that was interesting or new to me. So, um, but um, I wanted to thank you also for all the information. And this guy's name was Huberman. Yeah, H U B E R M A N. Right, Huberman. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I put the YouTube link in the chat too, if anyone wants that. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank so you guys will continue to get some, hopefully the emails that I sent out uh, before this were helpful. Did you all see my cold plunge in the, <laughs> good, good. Um, you'll get some emails from me uh, on the other end of this too. And if you're watching the recording, same thing. And like I mentioned, if there's anything that you heard in here that kind of like sparked some curiosity or inspiration for you based on like basically, you know, where you're at in your healing journey and what's coming next and in ways that you can really kind of like hack your habits, you know, I'd say that cold exposure is definitely a biohack. And one of the things I'm really into is just like that you can hack your habits as well and you can actually design your habits. You don't have to be stuck in kind of whatever the rote or the routine thing is. So much of the time, it's like we feel called to make this change, but we just can't find the resolve. We can't find the resilience around it. And as much as cold exposure helps, um, I believe that support also really helps and really makes a huge difference. And I would love to support you on your journey. 
so you'll find an email from me after this talk with the invitation to schedule a follow-up conversation. And yeah, I'd be really happy to extend and just like have a have an important and valuable conversation. It's like one of the best things I feel like I can offer people right now is a powerful coaching conversation. So um, I look forward to, to doing that with each of you. And um, in the meantime, namaste. Thanks so much for coming to Cold Shower Curious. Have a good night. Thank everybody. you, Patrick. That was really helpful. Thank you. Oh, good, Nicole. It's so good to see you. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Patrick. you. Yeah, Thank you. Nice to see your that was great. Bye. Bye. See you. See you all later. Have a good night.